If you have God's word this morning, if you will turn with me to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. If you go back as you're finding Joshua chapter 1 in your Bible, if you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 34, the very last chapter, you realize that Moses, God's servant, has passed away that Joshua, his assistant, has been named to lead uh, the people into the promised land. And so uh, they mourn for about 30 days, and then we get to Joshua chapter 1. Beginning in verse 1, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, uh, our, and as the King James Version says, after it came to pass, uh, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise and go over this Jordan, you and all the people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness of this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea, toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will also be with you. I will not leave you or fail you. Uh, or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give to them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that, my, that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success. Wherever you go, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. And do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this marvelous passage of Scripture. Now, Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit would open these truths to our heart. Lord, help us to listen with the intent of obeying what you ask us to do. Lord, I pray that lives will be changed today so that you might be glorified in this message and in this place. Lord, I pray it and I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. An old sailor repeatedly got lost at sea, and his friends would have to go look for him. So finally, after one time of going to find him, they finally decided to buy him a compass. And they gave him a compass, and on his first voyage out, as usual, he became hopelessly confused and lost. And his friends had to go hunt for him again. When they found him, one of the sailors asked, Why didn't you use the compass we gave you? And the man responded, I didn't dare use it because I wanted to go north. But as hard as I tried to make the needle point in that direction, it just simply kept pointing southeast. That man was so certain he knew the direction he wanted to go that he wouldn't trust the compass. Is that not just like us? God wants to lead us into a preferred future, into a future that he has designed for us. But we're too busy making our plans and telling God to bless our plans. We're too busy telling God what we want to do rather than trusting him to lead us in the direction that he wants us to go. Would you agree with me that God knows 
the best possible future for you and your life. He wants to lead us into that future. He wants to lead you into the future that he's prepared for you. God has a plan. God had a plan for his children as we see here in this passage of scripture. Listen to some of the things that God says about the future. Jeremiah, in Jeremiah 29, 11, a very familiar passage of scripture uh, where God is speaking to his people and he says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil to give you a future and a hope. And those same words that were spoken to the people of God is true for the people of God still today and even is true on an individual level. Listen to some other verses. Uh, the psalmist tells us in Psalm 16, 5, Lord, you are my portion and my cup of blessing. You hold my future. In Psalm 32, 8, the psalmist says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you shall go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. That's the Lord's words. In Isaiah 48, 17, Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord your God, who teaches you to profit, who leads you in the way that you should go. You know, as we look on our world today, the world seems to be out of control. You know, I, I'm concerned, I don't know about you, but I'm, can kind of, I'm concerned about the world that my grandkids are going to grow up in. It's not the same world that I grew up in. Uh, things have changed drastically, and things have changed drastically in the last few months. It's easy when we look at the thing, way things are in the world to be worried and to be concerned. But here's the truth. People in every generation have been worried about the future. Try to imagine Joshua for just a minute. Think about Moses. Moses talked to God as one talks to a friend. He talked to God face to face. He went into the temple. He even got to see God's Shekinah glory from his backside, from the Lord's backside. Moses had a unique and a special relationship with God. Now we know that Joshua was a man of faith. We know that oftentimes when Moses would leave the tent of meeting and go back to his own personal tent, Joshua would remain at the, the door of the tent of meeting to pray and to seek the Lord's face. He was a committed and a righteous person, but he was not Moses. And so now Moses has gone off the scene. And I'm sure Joshua must have wondered, like all the children of Israel, uh, what's going to happen to us? Is God going to continue to be with us? Will we survive? For many of us, thinking about the future is just as stressful. Does God's word offer us any hope as we look towards the future in the world in which we find ourselves today? Of course it does. Joshua learned some important truths that helped him face his future, and I think they can also help us to face our future. What did he learn from God? Well, first of all, the Lord says, arise and move forward. Arise and go over this Jordan. Arise and move forward. You know, one of the things I struggle with the most, and I, my wife can confirm this, one of the things I struggle is, is I get too many things sometimes on my to-do list, and I start looking at them. And because I have so many things and I can't get them all done in one day, I just want to sit down and not do any of them. And, of course, I have to encourage myself to get up, to arise and move forward. The death of Moses was a huge event. Think about it for just a minute, who he was and what all had happened in the life, what all had happened to the children of Israel with Moses as their leader. Moses has passed away, and they've had a celebration for Moses. They mourned him for 30 days, which is the same thing they did for Miriam. For a national leader, that's what they did. They mourned for 30 days. And as the King James said, version says, and it came to pass. It sounds to me like Joshua and the people of Israel are on the eastern side of the promised land, getting ready to go across the Jordan River into the promised land, and they're just sitting there waiting. I don't know what they're waiting on. Maybe they're waiting on a lightning bolt from heaven. Uh, maybe they're waiting on God to the, the pillar of fire to, to lead them across, but the pillar of fire is not going to be there much longer. 
You know, circumstances can paralyze us just as it did Joshua. And God reminds Joshua, he said, Moses, my servant is dead. Now, therefore, arise and go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am given or I have given to them, to the people of Israel. You know, the time for grieving was over with. The time for focusing on the past was over with. Joshua, get up and get on with the task that I have given you. You know what Joshua wanted? How Joshua wanted things to go, what the people wanted, didn't really matter. What mattered was, would they follow God's leadership? Would they get up and move forward? God was about to change his method of working in and through his people. The pillar of cloud and pillar of fire are about to be gone. The minute that the children of Israel cross over into the promised land and eat of the fruits of that land, that very day the manna ceased. The quail that God had provided and the manna that God had provided had ceased. God was going to work in a new way. What was past was past. God was about to do something new. These people needed to put the past behind them and move forward. Here's the truth. Even though Moses was dead, God's plans for his people were not dead. God still had a plan. He made a covenant with his people. He had promised to their forefathers. And since God couldn't uh, make a promise on anything greater, he swore on his own self that he would most certainly give them the promised land. You know, some people today get stuck in the past. I have all too often witnessed as pastor uh, people who get stuck in grief. They lose a loved one. Maybe they lose a child in death. I know that's a horrible, difficult thing for any person to experience. Maybe they lose a loved one in death. Uh, maybe they lose somebody close to them. And they just quit living. They just get stuck and they sit there and they miss so many blessings that God has prepared for them in the future because they're still living in the past. And let's be honest, many of us and all of us at certain times struggle with living in the past. We, we long for the good old days. We start talking about stuff and we talk about, you know, when, we, when, when everybody left their doors unlocked, when kids could ride their bicycles across town without any, any danger or anybody worried about them. Uh, we dwell on the good, day, good old days and we long for things to be the way they used to be. While we need to study history from, from what it teaches us, I tell my students all the time as I'm teaching church history that we need to study church history so that we can learn from not only the, the blessings or the things they did right, the church did right, but we can also learn much from what the church did wrong. And so we do need to look at the past, but we're not ever going back to the past. God is doing something new every day. And you and I need to move forward. If we cling to the past, we will miss the blessings that God has in store for us. We cannot live longing for God to do what he did in the past. God would not work through Joshua the way he worked through Moses. God will not work through us like he did for those who came before us. As I look at Rock Hill Baptist Church, where we are and where does God want to, where does God want to lead us? Here's what I know. We've been given orders by the King of Kings to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. Baptizing, teaching, instructing, uh, commanding. We've been commanded to go and to make disciples by teaching and baptizing and discipling. That's not just the responsibility of the staff. It's not just the responsibility of the pastor. It's not just the responsibility of the deacons. It's the responsibility of all of us. Jesus speaking to his disciples, but he, he said, but you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost part of the world. The mission of the church is to make disciples. We can do a lot of good things. 
We can have great worship times. We can have great times of fellowship, enjoying each other's company. We can take meals to shut-ins. We can give away clothes. We can minister to those who are hurting. But our primary task, all of those things are good and we don't need to stop doing them. Please don't hear me wrong. But our primary mission is to make disciples of all nations and all people groups. Our world has changed. And it continues to change every day. But here's the truth. God's word never changes. What does that mean? Culture changes, but God's word doesn't change. What does that mean for us? It means that we must discover new methods, new ways of reaching peace people with the gospel, the great message, the good news of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We must arise and move forward, trusting God to lead us in the right direction. No magic pill exists for reaching our, God, our world with the gospel. It's going to take powerful prayer. It's going to take every one of us being intentional about sharing Jesus Christ with people around us. That means we've got to get up and move out of our comfort zone. Much like the people of God had to do, they were sitting by the side of the river, a stone's throw away from the promised land that God had already given to them, and they were just sitting there. They had to arise and move forward. Well, I can preach for a long time right there, but let me move on to the second truth that they learned. The second thing that God tells to Joshua is be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Joshua must have been really lonely. He must have been anxious and fearful because he knew Joshua had gone into the promised land as a spy the first time around. And when he was, he was one of the ones who brought back a, a positive report that they needed to go in because God was going to be with them and God had already given them that land. But the people disobeyed God. Joshua must have been thinking to himself, will they obey God this time? The situation hadn't changed, did he? They still were fortified cities and big walls and big armies with chariots and all that kind of stuff. Israel had none of that. But they had what nobody else had. They had God on their side. Joshua must have been paralyzed by fear and anxious about what was happening. God's word must have been great. Must have been a, a great encouragement to him because God says, "Be strong and courageous." This message is so important that God repeats it three times in this particular chapter. Wow, what challenging words! Our world's in a mess, isn't it? We've got coronavirus. We've got plagues. We've got famine. We've got plagues of locusts that are eating crops. We've got people that are dying from this virus. We've got civil and social unrest. It's easy to be paralyzed by fear. It's hard to stand up and be counted for God when what we really want to do in our flesh is to blend in with the world around us. We don't want to stand out. We don't want anybody to notice us. But if we're going to complete the mission that God has given to this, his church, we must we must be strong and courageous. We must stand up and say, Thus saith the Lord of hosts. Repent. Turn from your wicked ways and turn towards the one, the only one who can make a difference in your life. You know, it's sad that we get more worked up sometimes about sports teams and politics than we do the lost world around us. I can tell you this for certain. Sports or politics or Hollywood or anybody else is going to fix the problems in this world because the problems in this world are because of sin. It's because of sin that we're experiencing what, we, what we're experiencing right now. And what can wash away my sin is nothing but the blood of Jesus. No politician can do that. God calls us to be strong and courageous. He calls us to stand up and be counted. Reminds me of a man who's later known as the father of modern missions, but during his day, he was a young man. He was a shoe cobbler. He was uneducated. He literally taught himself how to read and write, taught himself Latin, Greek, and Hebrew while he was cobbling shoes at a cobbler's bench. 
As he began to look at the world and study the world, he, he became acutely aware the Holy Spirit convicted his heart that there was a lost world out there that needed Jesus. And so he began to talk in a day and time when Calvinism was uh, extreme, hyper-Calvinism was the rule of the day. And he continued to preach that they needed to do something. The pastors and his association needed to do something to reach a lost world with Jesus Christ. One time he passionately stood up to, to say that message, to say that they needed to do something to reach a world. And one of the pastors there said, sit down, young man. When God wants to convert the heathen, he will do so without your help or mine. But that didn't dissuade William Carey. He was strong and he was courageous. He continued to teach. He continued to preach. He continued to talk about the church's responsibility to reach a lost and dying world. And when through his preaching and through the movement of the Holy Spirit and encouragement of some friends, God finally led that association to establish the first missionary society to reach lost people with the gospel of Jesus Christ, the first Protestant missionary society among Baptists. He offered himself to serve as a missionary. He was not well educated. As he told somebody, he said, I'm not the greatest missionary, he said, but I know how to plod. And that's what he did. Little bit by little bit, he went to, to India with a reluctant wife. After losing a couple of their children in death, his wife went insane and literally she would be screaming to the top of her lungs in the next room while he was trying to translate the scriptures into the language of the Indian people so that they could learn about Jesus Christ. He buried several wives and a number of children, but he continued to be faithful until the end of his life. God, notice, did not give Joshua a step-by-step -step explanation about what he was going to do or how he would accomplish the giving of the promised land to God's people. He simply told him to arise and move forward, to be strong and to be courageous. You know, God calls us every day to follow him. He doesn't give us a road map. Oh, man, I wish he would. I wish there was a road map that I knew exactly where we were going to be six months from now, exactly where we were going to be next week and next month. But God doesn't do that. God simply says, be strong and courageous. Arise and move forward and follow me. God will provide as we walk and step out by faith. God will provide what we need uh, and the directions that we need when we step out in faith. We're going to see that in the very next chapter in, in Joshua because they came up to the Jordan River and God, God told them when the priests carrying the ark step out into the river, the waters will stop and you can go through on dry ground. It took them stepping out into the water before God did what he said he was going to do. In a time of life-threatening virus and civil unrest, God calls us to be strong and courageous. We must not cower in fear. We must move forward trusting in God. The last thing that Joshua learned that can help us as we face our future, God says, I will be with you. He said, Joshua, I will not leave you or forsake you in verse 5. In verse 9, he says, do not be frightened and do not do, be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Here's the truth. God never calls anybody to follow him without providing everything that person needs to do what he has called him or her to do. God never walks out on his promises. If anybody needed God to be with him, it was Joshua. Moses was a great leader. God did many signs and wonders through him. Joshua was his assistant, but God was not going to work through Joshua in the same way that he worked through Moses. Moses was considered a prophet. Joshua was considered the leader of an army. They were not the same people. Think about how rebellious the children of Israel had been under Moses' leadership, one who, who talked face to face with God, one where they saw the Shekinah glory of God, the pillar of fire, the pillar of cloud, where God provided for their every needs. He caused water to come forth from a rock out in the middle of the desert. 
God provided everything they needed, and yet they were still rebellious and disobedient people. That must have been weighing on Joshua's heart and mind as he thinks about what, he, what the future held. But when God said, Joshua, no matter where you go, I am going to be with you. Just as I was with Moses, I will be with you. Maybe not in the same way, but you can be assured, Joshua, that I will be with you. Guys, no matter where God leads us in the future, no matter if things don't go the way we think they ought to go, no matter if things get more difficult before they get easier, no matter if we uh, never are ever able to worship the Lord again like we've always worshiped him, no matter what happens, God is with us. Here's what Jesus said. If he went away, he was going to send the comforter. And that comforter was to take up residence in our life. He was to teach us and he was to guide us into all truth. That's what Jesus promised. The Holy Spirit of living God lives in us. That's why Paul could write over in Romans 8, if God be for us, who can be against us? And Jesus told his disciples to go and, uh, go and make disciples. And the very last thing he said to them when he gave that great commission is, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world or to the end of the ages. No matter where you go, no matter where you find yourself, no matter where the Spirit of God leads us, God is with us. As we face the future, we need to remind ourselves that God's with us. We need to remind us that the Holy Spirit lives in and through us. We need to be careful that we don't quench the Spirit by living in fear and disobedience. We must move forward. We must be strong and courageous. We must grasp and hold on to the truth that God is with us and will be with us no matter where we go. When you get to the end of the book of Joshua, I like Joshua gives his last sermon before the Lord takes him home. And this is what Joshua's observation was to the people of God. Found in Joshua chapter 23, verse 14. He says, Not one thing has failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spoke concerning you. All have come to pass for you. Not one word of them has failed. God never fails. He always does what he says he's going to do. Guys, God wants us to face the future with hope and with peace. He wants us to lean on him. He wants us to be strong and courageous to face the issues that are plaguing our country and our culture even today. He's given us great and exceedingly precious promises. I like what Proverbs 3 says. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. And he will direct your paths. You know that old sailor kept getting lost. Because he refused to follow the compass. What about us? God provides just what we need to lead us into the future. He tells us get up and get on. Quit living in the past. Move forward. He says, be strong and courageous. And he reminds us that he is with us no matter where we go. Here's what we can't do. We can't continue to insist that God does things our, our way, the way we want them to be done. We can't keep insisting that we go back to the way things were 30 years ago. It's just not going to happen. What we need to do is pray that God would send a great awakening to our country that would literally turn people's hearts and minds back to him. In the meantime, we need to be busy as a church and as individuals, telling other people about Jesus, bringing them to God's house where they can learn about, uh, about God's truth. So as I close, let me just ask you a couple of questions. If you're a believer in Christ, ask yourself these questions. Are you living in the past, longing for the good old days? If so, just simply confess that to God. Just say, God, I like things the way they used to be. 
I don't like all this newfangled stuff. But God, this is your church. And what you want is more important than what I want. The salvation of lost people is more important than me getting my way and doing what I want. Help me, Lord, to get up and move forward, to follow you every day, be strong and courageous, because the eternal destiny of lost people is at stake. And if you're here today and you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, let me, let me just tell you very simply the truth. The truth is God created you to be who you are. There's nobody else like you on this planet. And God loves you because you are one of his unique creations. God created you to live in a relationship with him. But sin separates you from God. And the only way that you can be restored, your relationship with God can be restored, is if your sins are forgiven. And the great news is that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God saw you in all your sinfulness and he still loved you. And he loved you so much that he sent Jesus Christ to pay the penalty of your sins that you might be forgiven so that your relationship with God might be restored. God knows what he wants to do in your life, both now and into the future. Do you trust him? Would you like to have a relationship with him? The Bible says if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. So if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, just invite Jesus to come into your life. Ask him to forgive you of your sins. Ask him to come and be the Lord and Savior of your life. Do it not just with your mind, but with your whole being. Cast yourself on the mercies of God. If you do that, you shall be saved. And if that's a prayer that you've prayed after we finish this worship service, I would encourage you to hang around for a few minutes and let me talk with you. If there's another decision that you need to make, I'll be around for a little bit after the worship service is over with. If you need to talk to me about something, just hang around for a few minutes. And we'll get a chance to talk after the service is over with. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.